I'm your host, Dennis Horvitz, the David Letterman of the Hopelessly Damned. Is love better, is love a better high than drugs? <laughs> no one's volunteering any information in this. Okay. Uh, well, it's an evolutionary process. Uh, according to research done by our guest uh, today, Dr. Lucy L. Brown, who is Professor of Neuroscience at the Albert Einstein uh, College of Medicine. She and her research partner, Dr. Helen Fisher, have uh, found that romantic love is better than drugs and apparently uses the same uh, system uh, affected by the use of cocaine. Uh, but the euphoria from love, uh, having evolved naturally, causes far fewer problems. Unless, of course, you're arrested for making a fool of yourself because you're in love. Um, but uh, it is a, uh, the, the, I guess, the electrochemical, whatever, I'm not a scientist, as you can probably tell. Uh, the process involved in what we call love is, is physiological, and it has an evolutionary advantage, reproduction. Because there's no evolution without reproduction. Uh, Dr. Fran and Fisher have been studying the brain, um, uh, the physiology of love since 1996, and have found among other things three stages of love. Lust, romantic love, emotional attachment. So uh, the, uh, the need for, uh, as uh, our publicist Jane uh, Fran says, the need for moonlight and roses is hardwired into the brain. And here to help us read the schematic is Dr. Lucy Brown. So I'm delighted to be here tonight to talk to you all. What I want to say to start with is that I'm a neuroscientist. And a lot of my message for you this evening is that all behavior is physiologically based. There are brain circuits that sometimes we can identify, sometimes not. But certainly for me as a neuroscientist, behavior is physiology. It's brain physiology. So have you ever had a heartache? Real heartache. I'm sure you all have. You felt it. You feel it. You feel it in your body. And we think about our hearts a lot. And poets have written about heartaches. And it's in poetry and literature that uh, we hear about love, mainly, say romantic love. And certainly, when you're in the early stages of romantic love, that intense infatuation, when you see the person, your heart rate goes up. So, we feel a lot in our bodies, but the point I want to make to you is that it's some brain circuits that are essential to this feeling and to our behaviors associated with love. So here I am, a neuroscientist. Um, I've been studying brain and behavior, but at a more oh, for 30 years or more, but more in a medical setting, looking at uh, the pathology and movement disorders, for example, like Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease. But of course, for me always, I got my degree in psychology, experimental psychology. The thing that was fascinating was that I was, I'm an, a neuroanatomist, I was studying the anatomy of the organ of mind. What more fascinating thing to be able to do you know, the, the kidney's great, the heart is a miracle. You know, pumping all this blood, all just miraculous. And we know a lot about those, the anatomy and physiology of all those muscles and the, um, but the brain, the organ of mind, that's certainly fabulously important and uh, can produce you know, information about this organ of mind is intellectually interesting and important, but also has many clinical correlates that are important for us. So, in a way, studying and what at first I thought was this emotion of love was 
uh, an intellectual curiosity for me. But the fact that it probably is also very important uh, to, for our understanding of something like drug abuse is important too. Now, I'm here to, tonight to tell you about a unique collaboration. It's myself, a neuroscientist, collaborating with Helen Fisher, an anthropologist, and a social psychologist named Art Aaron, who's at Stony Brook. <coughs> when we started these studies, it was a very unusual thing to do, to even think about studying romantic love. People were studying the brain physiology of fear, for example, and that's something that's important to understand for psychiatrists. But to study something, uh, a positive emotion, something that uh, so seemingly so ephemeral, how could you study this scientifically? Mm -hmm. um, but the three of us got together, and it was uh, Helen, really, who convinced Art Aaron and myself that it was important to study. We call it romantic love, early stage, intense romantic love. So for me as a neuroscientist, I ask myself these questions. Why study this? So for me, I was interested in the natural euphoria looking at the brain systems involved in euphoria. And so you, you can get euphoria with cocaine use, too. Then when I heard from Art Aaron that there's something called a passionate love scale, ah, as, a, as a scientist, this is everything. Uh, we can come up with a number for, for romantic love. We can come up with some quantitative measure. So our brain scans, what I'm going to be telling you about is studies of brain scanning where we get some quantitative measures. Uh, and to correlate these physiological quantitative measures with a psychological quantitative measure was very important to me. But also, as Helen pointed out, and I really haven't thought about it too much, this is a cross-cultural universal phenomenon uh, other anthropologists have studied this and looked at you know, something like 73 different cultures and found evidence for romantic love in, in poetry or in um, verbal reports from people in, in all of these cultures. And then, of course, the person you fall in love with is very often the person you marry and reproduce with. And so it's going to have genetic consequences, who you choose who you fall in love with will, is certainly going to influence our, our evolution. So again, I thought it was important to study something positive, a positive aspect of human relationships and understand that. But this is also, can be, you can go too far with something like romantic love and it can turn into stalking. Uh, certainly, when romantic love goes wrong, it results in depression, even violence. And it, as a matter of fact, plays a huge role in our culture and, and in crime, too. So what we're doing is we're beginning to study the neural mechanisms of mate choice that have all these influences on our society and, and ourselves as individuals. Now. One of, so Helen had some overall hypotheses, uh, which Art and I really agreed with and, and thought were great. And the first one that is up here on the slide I think is important. Romantic love is a developed form of a mammalian drive. It's not just a human thing. It's a developed form of a mammalian drive to pursue preferred mates so you can think of the human reproductive strategy as having three important aspects. Lust, or sex, and that, that gets you out there. <laughs> but uh, of course, we have to have that, right? 
uh, and and lust. You can feel lust under many different situations, and sometimes uh, for many different individuals. But romantic love or attraction, being really attracted to a, a specific individual, something different. It can involve sex and sexual feelings and lust. But when you focus on one person, when you're obsessed with them, that's a, another stage. It, the, one of the ideas is that it conserves energy. You don't have to go out looking every night. You know, the person is, the person is there. So uh, it also, the fact that if a couple stick together, and, and have this um, infatuation for each other, certainly through the first three or four years that, that it takes to get a child uh, born and, and in a community that can take care of it if you can't. If the couple can stay together, it's protective to rather, again, rather than being individuals roaming around. And then there's the attachment phase that can set in so, uh, after one, two, three years, when a couple will stay together up to 20 years, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, the romantic love is that stage when you can't think about anything else except that other person that, that we have studied. So attachment is, one way to define it is uh, after two or three years when it's not so exciting. It's great still, it's another stage uh, for pair bonding. When you feel a sense of calm being with the person, not a sense of anxiety whether they're going to call or not, but this sense of calm being with them. And the idea is that this romantic love that we think is so ephemeral really evolved as part of the human mating system. Now, another thing, when we began, psychologists were arguing whether they should think of romantic love, whether they should classify it formally as an emotion. Certainly we all feel emotional when we feel love, romantic love. But Art Aaron had been studying romantic love for several, for many years actually, for about 20 years as a social psychologist and giving people questionnaires. Uh, and he said, no, it's not just an emotion. It's a motivation. And what that, the motivation is when the goal, or the, when you're motivated to to eat, for example, you know, food is the goal. When you feel motivated, you have a goal. An emotion, technically, for the psychologists, is something that you can see in a facial expression in many mammals, not just us. So you can see anger in a facial expression. You can, you can see happiness in a facial expression, surprise, even. Uh, just when someone's walking down the street, it's, it's sometimes hard to tell when someone's in love just by their facial expression. I think occasionally you can tell, but um, plus uh, romantic that that feeling kind of comes and goes of uh, the happiness, the euphoria associated with romantic love, but the focus on the other person that stays, and that's a motivation. The other thing that we thought is that romantic love is something different from sexual desire and sexual arousal. And that uh, we would see different brain systems involved in those two things. We didn't do sexual arousal studies, but we compared our results to results from um, sexual, other sexual arousal studies. And before I talk about the brain scanning a little more, I just want you to see an example of this passionate love scale that was so important to me, right? Is being able to come up with a number. We gave people many questionnaires, but uh, this seemed to be one of the most important ones. And people would uh, scale these from one to, say, five. Five being, yes, this is the way I feel very much. And one, I really don't feel this way. 
So the first question, sometimes my body trembles with excitement at the sight of my beloved. Uh, I would rather be with my beloved than anyone else. I yearn to know all about my beloved. Turns out that an essential question for us in all of this was to ask the person, how often do you think about your beloved during the day? You know, is it 10% of the time during the day? Is it 50% of the time? 80% of the time? Uh, some people would say, I never stop. That's the problem. Even I, I can't sleep because I'm constantly thinking about him or her. So the people who s said 80% you know, of the time, we knew what, that they thought of the other person. So many said 100% of the time. We knew they were really in love. They were in the early stages of romantic love. Now, we're going to be talking about the brain, and many of you are not used to looking at pictures of the brain at all. So just for a few minutes, I want to orient you a little bit and, uh, and just give you some ideas about it and, and things that are going to come up. So this is the front of the brain. This is the back. And I'm just going to tell you that I want you to identify for yourselves here this outer core, this cortex, outer, outer rim, that I'll call the new brain, it's called neocortex. And this center area here that I'll call the middle brain. And we call this the brain stems, neuroanatomists, and I'll call this the old brain. So we know that these that we as humans have a much larger new brain up here than other mammals, but a lot of the middle brain and the old brain is very similar to uh, lower mammals. Um, for, the, for this region, this region, so all of these regions also interact. So we'll, there will be interactions here that we have to take into account as neuroscientists, neuroanatomists kind of thing. We, can, we both separate them for purposes of just thinking about it, right? but we know that these parts of the brain always are talking to each other. So I just want you to see a few slices. This is the way we do the anatomical imaging and we're now going through the new brain. So as you can see, here's the, you can clearly see the nose on this person. This is the front, this is the back. And the slices are being taken this way. So we call this a horizontal slice. This is the front, this is the back. How many of you have ever had an MRI of any sort, even on your arm? Right, okay. <laughs> so you know that it's noisy too, this machine. Uh, and probably the kind of MRI you had was, these MRIs are just great because of the detail that you can see of the anatomy. It's, it's just fabulous. Uh, for me as a neuroscientist to think that I can see inside the, the anatomy of a living, unanesthetized human or an awake human who's just lying there, and I can see this detail inside their brain is fabulous. But the second amazing thing is that we can see not just the anatomy, we can also see some of the function. We can see functional activity that's associated with blood flow. Just the way, you know, when you move a muscle, when you tighten a muscle and get your muscle going, you'll increase, because there's energy demand, you'll increase the blood flow to that muscle. So when your neurons, when your brain cells are working hard, they also need energy, and there will be local, very local changes in blood flow, a little bit of an increase in blood flow to bring more oxygen and, and glucose to that part of the brain. And that's, that's what we, a lot of cognitive neuroscientists are doing now. There, you, we know we can see this fantastic anatomical detail, and then we also add the function on top of it.
because the function, anatomy is basic, you have to have it. Uh, uh, anatomy is destiny, but, uh, but the function, of course, has to be there too. Now we'll just go through this, and you can, so we're still in new brain, so we cut through, new brain, new brain, and we're just now here beginning to see a bit of the middle brain here, so it's in the middle. And I'm showing you that area because it's, it, it is important for romantic love too. And now we're coming down, 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 and <coughs> this area here is old brain. Very small, but very influential. This area of the brain we call the ventral tegmental area, just for you to know that's a, a name we call it. It's, um, What's important about it for us tonight, and in general, is that it's rich in dopamine cells, cells that contain dopamine, manufacture it, and then project up to the new brain. And here we go, down through my colleague's brain. Now, how did we do this experiment? Here we are, we decided we want to study early stage intense romantic love. How are you going to do this? We had to do a few studies before we started our real study. For example, we did some studies to find out that really a picture of the beloved is the best stimulus, rather than the favorite song, or touch, or smell. The picture, showing someone the picture of their beloved evoked the most emotion, shall we say. Uh, so we decide on pictures, but when you do these brain scanning studies, things that happen very fast. You show a picture for, say, 20 seconds. And then you can't just show one picture, a picture of the loved, and see, all, and see the brain activity and know what's going on, because there are parts of the brain that just respond to a face, any face. And there'll just be um, activity related to the visual system. This is a noisy machine, as you all know. There will be activity just related to the sound of the machine. So you have to show another similar picture that you can subtract all of that other activity out and find out what's specific to the picture of the beloved and the thoughts the person is having about the beloved. So you have to compare what we call positive, positive picture, that's the positive stimulus, is compared to the neutral stimulus. And we knew because of you know, the restrictions of the machines and um, the technology, we'd have 20 seconds for each. But if you're asked to think about your beloved for 20 seconds and you're really in love with them, that's, I don't know if any of you remember how Tom Cruise jumped up on Oprah's couch or something. I don't know what but, you know, you're, and you tell them to then stop thinking about the person, that's not so easy to do, just stop. And so we came up with this idea that to, to stop the thinking, to kind of clear the mind, we'd have people count backwards by sevens from a large number, like 1,689. And people report, again, we had to do experiments before we did the main experiment to make sure that would work, and we found that that worked, that worked very well, and people reported that that worked well. So we recruited. Um, students from college campuses, they were, you know, around 20 years old. Um, there were a few that were, say, 27, 28. Uh, we asked them to bring in pictures of their beloved and what we'll call an emotionally neutral person. It was good. It had to be a familiar face. So <coughs> students on campus could um, choose someone who they knew, who they saw every day in a classroom, for example. So it would be a familiar, relatively familiar face. Uh, and that was the comparison. They, they were asked, they were instructed to think romantic thoughts when they saw their beloved. One young woman said, uh, I remember the night we, we walked to the 7-Eleven at midnight and we you know, bought some Entenmann's cake and walked back hand in hand, right? So you never know what people are going to come up with. Um, and the neutral, the, the neutral person, well, you know, I sat with her watching TV. 
so here you, you now, of course, they're all kind of just beginning neuroanatomists, so you recognize these horizontal brain sections here, right? These are, um, this is that old brain here, and we're getting up into the middle brain here, and then we have old brain, all of this cortex. What I'm showing you here is the anatomical image and the functional activity, that increase in blood flow, superimposed on the anatomical image. And I'll just say in passing that the will be done for this to happen it, uh, takes, takes a lot of computer power, a lot of time. Uh, but this image is the image that um, of just for just any face, or uh, the neutral face, or the beloved, but you'd have um, no, no, uh, no activity subtracted out for visual activity or auditory activity. You see, there's quite a bit of activity when you just look at, at someone's face. In the next image, you'll see how specific the activity can be. This is the the middle brain activity here, some of it here, these red, these red dots. This in indicates, the red and yellow and white indicates increases in blood flow specific to the picture of the beloved. 